Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. How likely is it that we'll find intelligent alien life on other planets? And if we do, what will it be like? Will they take us to their leader? Because I'm sure they've got some great ideas. (laughs) In this episode, we're going to discover how a math equation and our own evolution can help us on our search for intelligent life on other planets. Okay, Marshall, one of the greatest quests in science is to find life on other planets. And one of the biggest questions in that quest is whether there's life that's like us. You mean like the kind that we see in science fiction where people basically are human actors, but they have pointy ears? (laughs) (laughs) Pointy ears or no, the technical term is intelligent life. It means life beyond Earth that could build civilizations and technology like us. Do you think it exists? I mean, I think given the size of the universe, there's no way that it doesn't exist, but I just think it's probably really, really far away. But what about you? Well, I just, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we asked some kids. So let's hear what they think. Hi, my name is Madeline. I'm eight years old. I think that there may be living things like bacteria on other planets, but I do not think there are what we picture aliens. My name is Shepard. I'm six. I think aliens would look like three armed creatures with six heads. Hmm. I I think, honestly, Madeline seems to me like the most realistic of the two kids, though I like Shepard's idea a lot. There's lots of cool ideas of what aliens could be like. So let's ask our listeners what they think. Do you think alien life exists? And how would scientists find out? Because we're about to set off on our search for the possibility of alien life in the universe. So now that you've thought about your answer, um, where do we start in our search for aliens? First, we have to figure out what we're searching for. And to do that, we're going to talk to two scientists. The first will help us figure out where aliens could live, and the second will help us see what alien species could be like. All right, who's our first guest? We're about to meet a planet hunter and alien life expert named Caitlin Rasmussen. There's just so many possibilities for life to exist and for it to be different and totally bizarre and really cool. And I just want to spend all my time studying that. So although life could take many forms, Caitlin says scientists don't really agree on how much could be out there. So if you ask a bunch of scientists this question, you'll get a whole bunch of different answers. Some people think that the galaxy is just totally full of life, like there's aliens everywhere and we could talk to them. But other scientists think the opposite. And some people think that Actually, the Earth is super rare, and we might not have uh, any other aliens in the galaxy at all. Okay, wow. Um, So who's right, and how would we find out? Well, that's a question that scientists have been asking themselves for a really long time. So back in 1961, an astronomer named Frank Drake came up with a math equation to try and answer it. It's called the Drake Equation. Ooh, a cool equation that gets its own name. That's because the Drake Equation is probably one of the most famous math equations in astronomy. It's a way to think about the probability or likelihood that we will find intelligent life on other planets. There's really only a very small subsection of scientists who actually study and use the Drake Equation and try to figure out exactly what those percentages might be. Okay, so it's like trying to figure out how likely it is that I'm going to get cookies in the mail today. (laughs) Right now, I'm thinking it's like 30% not going to happen, 70% going to happen. Why Um, do you think that? (laughs) I'm just guessing. (laughs) Maybe today if I see a package arrive, that likely number gets like a lot higher. (laughs) Well, the Drake equation is a bit more complicated because it's getting at a Bigger question. How many species, how many intelligent alien people are out there in the Milky Way today that people could talk to? 
So to figure this out, Drake divided this question into two parts. The first asks how many planets intelligent life could evolve on. So you have to think about how big the Milky Way is, how many stars are in it, how many of those stars have planets, how many planets does each star have. All right, so I'm keeping track here. So we got to know how big the Milky Way is, which is like really big. How many stars are in the Milky Way? And for every star that has planets, like we need to know roughly how many planets do they have? Astronomers have been working to fill in those blanks. I think the most recent estimate is if a quarter of all the stars in the Milky Way have planets that are a good distance away from their star to support liquid water, that answer is 25 billion planets just in our own galaxy alone. It's a really big number. I mean, I think something our little human monkey brains have trouble processing is exactly how big a billion is. It's crazy. It would take forever to search all those planets. That's where Caitlin's work comes in. With the help of high-powered telescopes, she searches the galaxy for planets with the right ingredients for life, like water and land and elements like carbon and nitrogen. That would be my dream. That would be the coolest possible thing that I could run into in my career is another perfectly Earth-like planet. So what if we find an Earth-like planet? Like, what, what would we even be looking for? And how would we know that it's got intelligent, six-headed, three-armed creatures on it? That's where the second part of Drake's equation comes in, right after this. Okay, so we just talked to Caitlin about the first part of the Drake equation, where we could find alien life. The second part of the equation is about finding those aliens we can talk to. And our guide comes from kind of an unusual place. So I study how animals came to be the way they were, how they evolved to be the way that they were. That's Eric Kirschenbaum. He's a zoologist. Okay, but as I understand it, a zoologist studies animals, and we're doing an episode about aliens. Did we take a wrong turn in the A science section? Eric's name starts with A, too, and he's an author of a book called The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy, What Animals on Earth Reveal About Aliens and Ourselves. And he's thought a lot about the Drake Equation. Now, while a lot of the terms of the Drake Equation are quite well understood, like how many planets there are. Some of them are less well understood, like what's the probability of life evolving on a planet. But in recent years, we've made a lot of progress in understanding that. And I think we feel a lot more comfortable now that life is probably not as extremely unlikely as, as people once thought. So he's saying we're feeling good about the first part of the Drake equation, which Caitlin took us through. But what about the second part? So here, the big question is, how much of the life we find is intelligent enough to make technology that could send out signals? Yeah, so like they'd be able to send out distant beep beeps into the darkness of space. <laughs> exactly. So Eric says to know how likely it is that we'll hear a message from another civilization and what that civilization would be like. We need to look at Earth, starting with the story of how we evolved. Well, the fun thing about studying how animals evolve on Earth is that evolution is something that is common throughout the universe. This is the way that life arises. It's the way that life arose on Earth. It'll be the way that life arose on other planets. So he's saying if you know something about evolution on our planet, you know something about evolution on other planets. Exactly. And that means what the planet is like shapes what its life is like. The way that animals look is very, very much dependent on the kind of environment that they live in. So whether we have alien fish on a watery planet, or alien birds, or both. Or more. Eric says that our Earth rules of evolution apply to other planets because we think there are universal rules behind how the universe works, which goes back to math. So we know that these laws of evolution, these are mathematical laws, just like the laws of physics. And just like the laws of physics apply everywhere, math applies everywhere. 
I guess that makes math a good way to think about the universe. Uh, Drake was really onto something. Right. Because if math is the same everywhere, it means evolution is the same everywhere. And Eric says that means intelligence might come about the same way it did on our planet. And that starts with living in groups. Once you live in a group, uh, you have a huge advantage because you can cooperate, you can help each other to find food, you can help to protect each other and so on. But there's also competition. Eric says that living in groups, things can get complicated. You need communication. You need communication to tell the other person in your group that you are happy or that you are angry with them. Or the classic, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. (laughs) No one knows for sure how human language evolved, but a popular theory says that our lives in groups had a lot to do with it. And what seemed to happen with with humans was that when our ancestors reached a certain level of, of complexity of the groups in which they lived, then our own language um, evolved and, and, and was born. And our, and our communication became so complex that we could suddenly we could say anything. And that's why there are so many podcasts and so few of them are hosted by dogs. <laughs> exactly. Which leads us to technology, what aliens would need to make in order for us to find them. You know, we're not going to hear from or, or speak to another alien civilization unless they can build technology. And you can't really build technology on your own, right? You need to live in a group. You need to have people to help you build things and lift things and, and, and pass you the tools and things like that. <laughs> Passing the tools is one of the more important roles there is. But maybe aliens have so many hands that they don't need anyone to do it. Beyond passing the wrench, technology like ours is a big group effort. So does Eric think that it's likely that an intelligent species would evolve to make technology, which would allow us to find them? That's kind of the whole point of this equation, right? Right. So let's recap Eric's theory. It seems that on any planet on which there is life, eventually there will be animals and there will be plants or their equivalents. And there will be complex interactions between these, including animals that have complex social interactions and complex communication. In other words, we can imagine that alien life might follow our path. So, like, eventually they'd invent the alien internet in alien Instagram? (laughs) Maybe. What would they share? Hashtag (laughs) blurpork. And it's tempting to say that given enough time, a species that's capable of building machines and radios and, and spaceships and so on would evolve. The key here, though, that doesn't feature in the Drake equation is eventually, given enough time. So what does he mean by that, like, eventually, given enough time? Well, to find the rare, intelligent life in our galaxy, humans also have to be using technology at the same time. And there's been a lot of time in the universe. It's been over three and a half billion years since life arose on Earth. And we've got no way of knowing whether that's fast or slow or or, or anything else. So we could be like two ships passing in the night. Maybe aliens were looking for us billions of years ago when we were still like little single-celled life forms. We'll just never know. (laughs) Well, unless we get a message from them like now. So how likely is that? My own personal guess is I, I think it's quite unlikely. Um, certainly unlikely in, in my lifetime. But again, it's it, it could happen tomorrow. I think the takeaway here is we should always be prepared for an alien message, but like not that hard. The other takeaway is that we may never solve the Drake equation, but using math gives us a way to think about a scientific problem in creative ways. And that's why we should consider what a scientist who studies animals has to say about aliens. So my ideas are not controversial, but they're very unusual because no one's got to the stage yet of thinking about, wait a minute, how are these animals interacting with the plants and with the other animals? And what's that going to do to evolution? We just haven't got to that stage yet. But I think it's time. I think it's time we start thinking about these things. I mean, I guess when aliens come to Earth and abduct people, we usually don't think of them as being part of a whole food web. (laughs) (laughs) When you're being beamed up, you're usually not like, hmm, (laughs) I wonder what kind of ecosystem developed this technology. (laughs) Maybe it's time. So how do you imagine alien environments? 
Draw a picture. Think about the landscape of your alien planet and draw the types of plants and animals that might evolve to live there. Label the different parts of your drawing to explain how those creatures evolved and think about the food webs that they're part of. Maybe they have like big giant teeth to eat big giant animals that need to be captured with big giant teeth. It could be anything. And send us your drawings to tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We'll love to see them. Thanks today to Dr. Caitlin Rasmussen, astrobiologist at the University of Washington and the Virtual Planet Laboratory, and also author of the forthcoming book, Life in Seven Numbers, The Drake Equation Revealed. Thanks also to Dr. Eric Kirschenbaum, zoologist at Cambridge University and author of The Zoologist's Guide to the Universe, What Animals on Earth Reveal About Aliens and Ourselves. And special thanks to Shepard and Madeline for sending in your answers. You can hear more from our interviews with Caitlin and Eric in our bonus interview episode, available on Patreon when you pledge just $1 or more a month at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll also have free resources to learn more on the blog on our website at sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this episode and created the episode art. Elliot Hitchaj was our production assistant, and Gary Calhoun-James engineered and mixed it. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode along with Sarah. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media, and now you can listen to our podcast on Amazon Music, as well as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for listening, and tune in next time for more stories of science discovery.